Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 6. Uh, Genesis chapter 6. The month of May, we brought some messages, lessons from Old Testament women. Next couple of Sundays, we'd like to share some sermons, lessons from some Old Testament men. In Genesis chapter 6, I want to share with you a message entitled, Lessons from a Shipbuilder. Lessons from a Shipbuilder. I'd like to look, if you would, in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. On a warm summer evening in 1907, managing director of the White Star Liner, Bruce Ismay, and senior partner and chairman of the shipyard Harlan and Wolf, Lord Perry, cons conspired to build a ship bigger and better than its rival company. After the dinner, the two men met together and schemed to bring to build the three largest ships in the world, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Gigantic, which later became the Britannica. In 1911, 1912, and 1913. The work began on December 1907 on the first of the three mammoth ships to be constructed, the Olympic. In order to accommodate the size of these huge ships, the largest gantry ever constructed was built so that workers could work upon the ships on all sides. Construction on the Titanic began on March the 31st, 1909. At the peak of the construction, Harlan and Wolf Shipyard employed approximately 14,000 people people working on these enormous ships. It took one year to fully frame the Titanic. The large steel plates were then riveted to the frame. It took more than three million rivets to hold the steel in place. On October 1910, the ship, the shell, shell a plating on the Titanic was complete. The hull of the Titanic had 29 boilers containing 159 furnaces which powered two huge engines. The engines were the largest ever built at nearly 40 feet tall and 9 feet in diameter. The boilers were so massive, looming two stories tall, in 1912 when the ship was completed, it was the largest man-made object ever built. The Titanic, as you know, was can't claim to be unsinkable. Its watertight construction had 15 watertight bulkheads that divided the ship into 16 compartments. The thought was that if four of the smaller compartments flooded, the ship could still float. However, the bulkheads only reached about 10 feet above the waterline, allowing the water to reach from one compartment to another, thus defeating the purpose of the bulkheads. In 1911, the Titanic was released from its dry dock and interior work began. The grand work that was started on the Titanic, nothing would be held back. Every cabin or suite had running water. That was something that many of the passengers that got on board did not have. A luxury of the third class. Perhaps the most iconic of the Titanic's grandeur was the first class passenger's grand staircase. The staircase was lit from the natural light from the glass dome and illuminated at night with crystal lights. Again, 
as it uh, was uh, christened on May the 31st, 1911, a large crowd of 100,000 people watched as the financier J.P. Morgan and Lord Pierre and the chairman of Harlan and Wolf and J. Bruce Ismay, chairman of the White Star Liner, and Thomas Andrews, who was the managing director overseeing the building of the Titanic. On April the 2nd, 1912, the Titanic completed its sea trials and was deemed seaworthy. Eight short days later, the Titanic would set sail on its maiden and last voyage. And as you know, on April the 15th, 1912, it was struck by an iceberg. I won't go into all the story of the sinking of the Titanic, but Bruce Ismay was one of the last people to board the lifeboat. He learned a horrible lesson about his ship, the unsinkable Titanic. Thomas Andrews, who was the head of the drafting department, one of the designers of the Titanic, died when it went down. But I want to call your attention this morning to another shipbuilder. His name was Noah. In fact, this was his first and last ever ship that he built. He wasn't real experienced about building ships, but he had a master designer. A divine designer, we could say. His name was God. He followed God's blueprints to the T. And it didn't even leak after the greatest storm ever known to mankind. And there are some lessons we can learn from this shipbuilder. His name was Noah. And as we see in Genesis chapter 6, and as we'll be looking back in chapter 5, the three areas and three lessons we can learn from Noah, the shipbuilder. First of all, I want to look at Noah's family. Noah's family. Maybe Noah could sing that song we sang this morning. Faith of our fathers. What a godly heritage that Noah had. His father was Lamech, as mentioned in chapter 5. Lamech lived to be 777 years old. Isn't that a good number, 777? His grandfather was Methuselah. He lived longer than anyone in the world, 969 years. His great-grandfather never died. His name was Enoch. He was raptured, in fact, at the age of 365. Well, I'm in my 60s, and I'm feeling kind of old myself, but uh, 365, I mean, he was a young whippersnapper uh, back in, in Noah's day. But Noah came from the line of Seth, you remember. When Cain killed Abel, his brother, Remember, one was a murderer and one became a martyr. Eve said about Seth, God hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. You see, Seth means the appointed one. Because Eve remembered that promise that God had given to her in Genesis 3.15, that the seed of the woman would one day bruise the head of the serpent. And she looked forward that it, maybe this was the seed. She believed it. She believed that word that was given in her day. But not only did Noah's family consist of some godly patriarchs, but his family consisted of a prophet. A prophet. 
If you're there in chapter 6, look back in chapter 5 and verse 24, and it says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. In other words, Enoch didn't die. Can you imagine the, the Bible talks about, can two walk together except they be agreed? And as, and as God and Enoch walk together, what a precious sight. Now, through the years of our marriage, my wife and I have enjoyed walking. Now, she gets on to me that I don't walk with her as much as I used to, but we've walked all over this neighborhood and we went back to our old town and we saw the hills, one hill this way, another hill this way, another hill this way. We walked all over those hills. And uh, when you're walking with somebody, you're not going to walk with them very far if you don't agree. So Enoch and God are walking. They're talking and fellowshipping together. One old Bible commentator said, God turned around and said, Enoch, we're closer to my home than we are yours. Why don't you just go home with me? And he did. But what is interesting about Enoch is he was a prophet. In fact, he prophesied of two judgments that were to come. I wonder where he learned that from. I believe it was in his conversation of he and God walking together. And God said, Enoch, let me tell you about two judgments that I'm going to bring to this earth. The first judgment that would come, he emphatically named his son Methuselah. Methuselah. Now, for time's sake, I won't go into the Hebrew and all the different commentators, but I'm just going to simply translate it as uh, Jameson Fawcett Brown said, When he dieth, the sending forth. Or some have interpreted it to mean, When he dies, it shall come. Well, what is he talking about? It shall come. In other words, he's talking about the judgment of God. Again, Answers in Genesis uh, makes this comment about it. There were surely many who had mourning periods that are simply not mentioned in the Bible. In light of this, others have suggested that these seven days were also a mourning period for Methuselah. I don't have time to get into the, the context, but it does mention that they got inside the ark and then for seven days. What did they do for those seven days? Many believe it was the mourning of Methuselah. Because his name means when he dies, it shall come. It what? God was saying to Enoch, Enoch, I'm going to bring judgment. And it's going to come at the end of your son. So he named him Methuselah. And I believe that when old grandpa Methuselah died, God said, it's time for the flood. It shall come. Then there was another prophecy that Enoch gave us. Genesis doesn't tell us about it. And God didn't choose to tell us about it in the Old Testament. But he tells us about it in the New Testament. So God told uh, uh, Enoch about another coming judgment. He told him about the coming judgment of the flood. But he also told him about the coming judgment of the second advent. Listen to the book of Jude chapter 14. As the half-brother of our Lord is writing, he says this, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of thee, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment upon all and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed and all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. You think the word ungodly is used in this prophecy? 
So in other words, God told Enoch about two judgments. One, when he is dead, it shall be sent. Name your son that. And then he told him about the second judgment that will come to this world, a future judgment. Revelation 19. When God comes with His church and all the redeemed, God told Enoch about these two judgments. And he believed it. And God shared it with us in His Word. Noah's godly posterity, Noah's godly patriarch family, his family consisted of prophet, but his godly posterity. Noah came from a godly line that taught the truth. There is no recorded scripture at this time. Now remember, the book of Genesis wasn't written by Noah, wasn't written by Adam. It wasn't written until Moses wrote the account of creation. It doesn't mean, though, there was not godly truth passed on from one generation to another. Don't you know that Adam and Eve told their son Cain and Abel and even Seth about the garden, about the curse and what had happened? about how that their brother was a murderer and sin came in because we disobeyed God. Well, then Seth told Enos all these stories. And then Enos uh, taught Cana about all these stories and these truths. And then Cana taught Mahali about all these stories. And then Mahali taught Jared and then Jared taught Enoch. And then Enoch taught Methuselah before he died. And then Methuselah taught Lamech. And then Lamech taught Noah. Isn't it interesting that maybe they heard about all of these things about Jehovah God, that man was made in the image and sin, and all those wonderful truths. John Phillips said this, that Noah was brought up to cherish the great truths of Scripture as they were verbally and infallibly transmitted to those far-off times. You see, it's interesting as he believed the word that was given to him. Not written down yet. And maybe there was some written account, but it was not inspired. God only preserved the inspired account through Moses. But can you imagine that Noah had to believe God for himself? Coming from a godly night line did not automatically make him godly. And maybe you've come from a godly line. Maybe you were raised in church like, like I was. But coming to church and joining a church and being in a church doesn't make us godly and saved. It didn't make Noah saved. He had to believe God for himself. Even though the godly line that he had with his father Lamech, his grandfather Methuselah, and his great-grandfather Enoch. Oh, what a wonderful truth. Listen to what the writer of Hebrews tells us about this man named Noah. In Hebrews 11 and verse 6, And without faith it is impossible to, believe, to please him. But he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. We see that Noah had a godly family, but that didn't make him saved. So we look at Noah's faith. I believe it was Noah's saving faith. Noah had been told by his grandfather, Methuselah, and his father that the judgment was coming. You know, I, I love to read to my grandchildren. And when they come to my house, often the first thing they get is a book, and they back up. 
You know, I know what that means. You know, they get a book and they back up into uh, Papa's lap and they, they want a book. And when they come, I get a stack of books. We got a crate and, and they have their favorite books and they go and they I want uh, Papa to, to read them. I wonder if Noah got up in his grandpa's lap. And he said, uh, Grandpa, you have a funny name. What does that mean? Why, why did your dad name you Methuselah? A and what does that name mean? I believe he, he knew maybe his great-grandfather en uh, Enoch. But as Methuselah began to share with his grandson uh, Noah, oh, there's coming a judgment. Can't you see the wickedness and godliness of man? that is multiplying throughout the earth. And maybe he told him about Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. He said, God loves sinners, but He hates sin, son. Again, one commentator said, to find grace, you must see ourselves as sinners in need of grace. You see, grace means unmerited favor. Noah found grace. Again, one person said, God's grace reaches out to lost and ruined people and offers to them love, kindness, forgiveness instead of His wrath and judgment. The fact that He found grace reveals that He was a seeker. When a seeking sinner meets a seeking Savior, the result is a life-transforming conversion. Faith cometh by hearing. Where did Noah get his faith from? Hearing of the judgment that was to come. The stories that his grandpa had told him. That when I die, judgment is coming to this world. Can't you see the wickedness and the ungodliness of man all around us? You see, we too are saved by faith. Again, faith cometh by hearing. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. There's coming a judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after that the judgment. And when you stand before God, He's not going to say, well, you must have come from a godly family. That's not going to matter. He, you may say, well, I came from a good church. That's not going to matter. Well, I was baptized. Look at all these good works that I did. No, it's by grace through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith, yet that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works. You see, building the ark is, is not what saved Noah. You say, well, what if he didn't build the ark? He wouldn't have been saved. Yes, but his faith in God. He believed God. And of course, we know the truth that Jesus gave to Nicodemus who was a very religious man. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through Him might be saved. He that believeth on Him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. You see, Paul tells us about a judgment that is to come in the future. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, there's coming a judgment. And listen to what Paul would say to the Thessalonians in 2 Thessalonians 1.7 And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. That's the judgment that is to come. Put your faith and trust in the words of our Lord that He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And I'm so glad that Jesus Christ is our ark of safety. We can put our faith and trust in Him and He will save us. Again, 
The wages of sin is death, we said. But the gift of God, God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Listen to chapter 6 and verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations and Noah walked with God. I wonder where he heard that from. Chapter 7 and verse 1. And the Lord said unto Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for thee have I seen righteous before for thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Not only was Noah uh, had saving faith, but he had serving faith. Remember without faith? Uh, so again, God told Noah judgment was coming. Once through the name of his grandfather, Methuselah. And second, God told Noah personally. Yep, your grandfather was right. Listen to what he said in Genesis 6.13. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence and through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Remember Hebrews eleven six. Without faith it's impossible to please God. Well listen to verse 7. By faith Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. Never rained before. A worldwide flood? Ah... People laughed and made fun of Noah. Why are you building a boat in dry ground? But he moved with fear. Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. By the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. You see, Noah moved by faith. Faith is believing God and believing His Word. You got saved by faith. You believed that you were a sinner. You believed that Jesus loved sinners. You believed that you couldn't save yourself. For by grace are you saved through faith, yet that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. And to put your faith and trust in Him that God loves sinners. He died for sinners. He'll save sinners if you just simply ask Him. And turn in faith and repentance from your sin and look to God. And He will save you. But that's just the beginning. You don't work to get to heaven. You work because you're going to heaven. And here we see faith is obedience to His Word. In salvation and also in service. So now that God says to Noah, Noah, I need you to build me a boat. For you and your family. Isn't it interesting that when Paul got saved in Acts chapter 9 and verse 6, here's what he said, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Lord, what would thou have me to do? And of course we know the rest of that story, don't we? What did Noah do? He prepared, prepared an ark. God said, Noah... Here's the blueprints for this ark. I want you to, and I don't take time to read it for time's sake. It's going to be made of gopher wood. I want you to pitch it within and without. Here's the length of it, the, the, the breadth of it, the height of it. There's a window in it. I want you to make it three stories. Then I want you to get food for you and all the animals. Put it in the ark. And then I want, I'll bring the animals. You go in and I'll shut the door. Now let me ask you quickly. Was Noah saved by faith? He was. But he just didn't stand there on the mountain and say, be nice to have an ark. What did he do? He got to work. Now let me ask you another question. Was building an ark hard? Can you imagine all the timber? All the wood? No saws? No cranes, as we would understand them. No caterpillar tractors. 
But he began to build. And then he had to make the vats of pitch. Some commentators said he even got some of the unsaved people, maybe other family members, to help him. But for 120 years. I like when you go to uh, the Ark Encounter, if you've never been, I hope maybe one day you can go. And they have a section there where they, they have a newspaper reporter that interviews Noah. And the whole thing is scoffing. And, and it kind of puts it in today's term if they were to interview Noah and, and they're scoffing at him, making fun of him. Sounds like the media, doesn't it? Making fun of him, building this boat, judgment's coming, rain, God's going to judge the world. And, uh, but uh, again, could I say to you, isn't living for God sometimes hard? Even, isn't living for God sometimes difficult? For Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. We're not building an ark, but we're building a church. And it's hard. People don't want to listen. People laugh and make fun. Oh, Noah. Oh, uh, and they'll laugh at you. They'll laugh at me about a judgment that is coming and living holy lives and righteous like Noah and uh, live it up and party, Noah, like us. Eat, drink, and be merry. It's hard. When your peers and your friends and the worlds are sucking at you to, to come and, and live like us and be like us and don't worry about the future. Live for the present. Sounds a little bit like Peter. What he said in 2 Peter 3. He said, Knowing this, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant, that the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But Peter goes on. That was the first judgment that Enoch prophesied, you remember? But there's another judgment coming. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, the same word that what? The same word that prophesied of the first coming worldwide judgment. The same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. You see, Noah preached. What did he preach for 120 years? He preached by his life. He's building an ark. What are you building an ark for? He preached by his lips. There's coming judgment. My grandpa told me about it. God told me about it. And you need to repent and look to the one and only God. Judgment is coming because of your sin. Men are sinners. And they don't like to hear that, do they? Media doesn't like for us to call them sinners. Our educational system doesn't like for us to call kids sinners. The world doesn't like to be nailed down with being called a sinner. But God said, it's corrupt. And it's corrupt again. The wages of sin is death. But Noah preached. Noah preached. Judgment is coming. And he kept preaching. He kept building and he kept preaching and he kept building and he kept preaching. And that's what you and I are to do. It seems like people aren't listening. People making fun of me. Living a holy life, living godly, looking for the Lord to come. Scoffers. It's getting worse, isn't it? But Paul, Peter said they're willingly ignorant. Let me, let me close with Noah's future. Noah's commission is fulfilled. God gave him a job to do and he did it. And in chapter 8 and verse 1, 
And God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters assuaged. Noah's commission is fulfilled. He built the ark. He supplied the food. He got the animals in. in. Genesis 7, 16, God shut the door. Seven days later, the rain started, and it was more than just 40 days and 40 nights. I remember when I was a kid, you know, and it would rain and rain and rain. I'd always get scared. You know, it's going to rain 40 days and we're going to flood. Oh, no, it, it, was, it was more than just rain. The Bible speaks of the fountains of the deep were broken up. The windows of heaven were opened. It's called a deluge, a cataclysm. And God brought rain and judgment. Noah's family were safe. There were eight. But let me, let me challenge your thinking. Why just eight? Um, I got to thinking about this. Um, if, if you count, there's Noah and his, and his wife, Mrs. Noah, whatever her name is, we don't know. Well, that means there was only six. Count, not counting Noah. Eight altogether. You know, those wives, they, they got to have in-laws, don't they? Uh, there's got to be cousins, don't you think? There's got to be uh, uncles and aunts, don't you think? I mean, in that day, people lived seven, eight hundred years and had m multiple families, 10, 12 kids. So you got to I got to thinking about that. Well, well, what about all the nephews and the aunts and the uncles? What about these in-laws and these girls? Do you think they talk to their parents and their siblings about this coming judgment? What about the neighbors? What about friends? Some even said, uh, what about those who even helped him build the ark itself? Maybe he did. Maybe, maybe nobody helped him, but maybe some others did. But what about them? You, you helped me build this ark. You, you helped me cut down trees and make the pitch. And you did all. We don't know, but we do know there was only eight people on the ark. And I believe there was room for more. If you've ever been to the Ark Encounter, you'll know that once you get there. There was room for more. Maybe a, an in-law or two. Maybe a cousin or two. Maybe a few more. But no. That was all. Noah's converts. Only six. You know, nowadays if... If we were putting Noah in some of our Christian magazines, we'd say, what a failure. You only got six converts. The big giant ark and only six. But I believe Noah's conscience was clean when God shut that huge door. When you, when you visit the ark, it's not a PR, but I'm just saying, when you see that big door, and they got a, they got a cross on it. When you see that big door, know that God shut it. I believe Noah could say, my conscience is clean. I preached for 120 years. I begged my in-laws. I begged my cousins. I begged my nephews. I, I gave them the gospel. And I believe he could say, like Paul said in Acts chapter 20 and verse 26, I am pure from the blood of all men. Now let me ask you today, can you say that like Paul and like Noah? I believe when God shut that door, I did my very best. I gave the gospel. I tried to tell people that judgment was coming. I tried to tell them there's going to be a one world government. I tried to tell them there's going to be a seven year tribulation. I tried to tell them that God loves sinners. And he died on a cruel cross. I did my best. Let me, let me close with this illustration if you'll just hang with me. A few days ago we were reading this book and it happened to be the anniversary. The anniversary 
On May the 31st, 1889, the time varies. Some say it was 3.05, some say it was 3.10, and some say it was 3.15. But the South Fork Dam, 14 miles from Johnstown, broke. It had been raining severely for several days. In fact, Johnstown was a foot of water and more in some places. And that particular night, as people heard about the rain and all that was coming, they were nervous. A lady came busting into a local pastor's home there in Johnstown, and she made the comment, the, the dam's going to burst. And the pastor laughed, laughed at this lady and said, they've been saying that for 50 years. That dam's going to burst, the South Fork Dam. Oh, we could get into a lot of details about uh, uh, why it burst, but I won't get into that. But it did burst. And there were f about 40 Five minutes, 14 miles down the river was Johnstown, Pennsylvania. The dam contained 20 million tons of water before it gave way. About the same amount of water that goes over Niagara Falls in 36 minutes. The flood lines were found as high as 89 feet above the river level. The great wave measured 35 to 40 feet high and hit Johnstown going 40 miles per hour. And there were some that lived to tell the story that said it wasn't water that they saw coming. It was 40 feet, which is probably higher than this church building or so, of debris. You see, the water had taken out three towns already, but by the time it got to Johnstown, wiped them from the face of the earth. Three small towns. The force of the flood swept several locomotives weighing 170,000 pounds, as much as some 5,000 feet. It was a great devastation. But as it hit Johnstown, People say, well, well, what happened? Over 2,200 people died. 99 entire families died. 396 children. 124 women and 198 men were left widowed. Over, I think the statistics now is 777 people were later buried at Grandview Cemetery on unmarked graves because nobody claimed the bodies or they could not recognize the bodies in that cemetery. As late as 1911, bodies would be found in Cincinnati, Ohio. 1,600 homes were destroyed. 17 million in property damage were done at that time. Oh, it was a devastating flood. But you think, well, weren't the people warned? Yes, they were. As the men were working on the dam that morning, John Park, an engineer who worked for the Pittsburgh firm of Wilkins and Powell on a sewer system at the club, went to South Fork about 11 a.m. to start spreading the word about the dam's condition. It is getting ready to break. Park talked to people in South Fork and sent somebody to the telegraph tower at South Fork so that the messages could be sent down the valley. At least three warnings went out from South Fork that day and the last believed to have reached Johnstown at the um, telegraph office in downtown Johnstown at 3 p.m. But you know what the response 
of the people were? We've been hearing that for 50 years. We've been hearing that for 50 years. And it is something that we as believers say, the Lord's coming. There's judgment. There's a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. The judgment of God is coming. Ah, oh, you Christians, you've been saying that for 2,000 years. All the devastation. But let me close with this one last horror. As the flood swept through Johnstown, carrying locomotives, houses, trees, bodies dead and alive, it hit the railroad bridge just on the other side of Johnstown. The railroad bridge was, you know, built like this and water flowed through it. But the railroad bridge was made of stone and it held. But what it held was all the debris and all the stuff that came and clogged up. And then because of the houses and the stoves and the, and the fires, it caught fire. And people said they could hear screams of people who were being burned alive, who had survived the flood. But now they meet their death at the Johnstown Railroad with all the debris that burned. And they tried to rescue people, but they could not. And I don't know what the statistics are, but there were several hundred that died in the fires after the flood. And let me tell you, there's been two judgments that Enoch told us about. One was of water, and another one will be of fire. Are you telling folks? Hell's real. And if you don't know Jesus Christ, that's where people go that don't know Him. And one of these days, the dam's going to break. Would you bow with me in prayer? Do you know Him today? Maybe I, I've gone a little bit over today, but that's okay. I hope that on this Father's Day, you will search your own heart and say, Lord, am I ready for this judgment that's been prophesied for 2,000 years when Jesus said, I will come again. He's coming. Oh, and the Bible tells us about the future. Jimmy DeYoung said two-thirds of the Bible is prophecy and tells us about the future and what's going to come. He even closed his Bible out by giving us one entire book that tells us of the future. Do you know Him today? Do you know Him as your Savior? Have you put your faith and trust in Him? Not in your church membership, not in your good works, not in your family, but in the Lord Jesus Christ. For by grace are you saved. You need to know Him. We'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can know that heaven is your home. And then once you know that, you can tell others, judgment's coming. Father, help us to take this matter seriously. Help us, Lord, to believe that there is a judgment coming. And even Enoch told us about it. Help us to be ready. In Jesus' name, amen.